Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel with myself Isabella. I'm joined by Barry the cat who is just sleeping as usual with his belly in the air. It's what he does most of the time. If you're new here, I'm Isabella. I'm a graduate of the Vaganova Ballet Academy, possibly and arguably the best school in the world. I adore it with all my heart. And then I went on to dance with the Mikhailovsky Ballet and Eiffel Ballet before I returned to London and founded BWI, which is an online platform as well as international and local intensive. I'm here to help you. I'm here to make ballet make sense and for you to enjoy and learn as much as possible. I'm from London designed to help you with anything you are trying to achieve. From beginner to pro, we have classes, courses, plans and bespoke plans. In-depth courses focusing on specific things, stretch classes, workouts, point classes and more. Along with this, we offer online weekly classes so you can work with Isabella Live, building a relationship with your online coach. BWI truly brings you everything you need. Start today. Today we're going to be talking about the top things you should avoid in ballet class. So this is things you should not do. In ballet class, it's kind of this sacred place. We feel safe there, it's very meditative. As soon as the teacher comes in, she shuts the door and a different mood is placed. It's a place for you to really knuckle down and think, what is it I want to improve today? So it's a very meditative kind of space because we're constantly thinking, what am I trying to achieve today that's better than it was yesterday? You know, am I trying to do that, that pirouette exercise that didn't go well yesterday? and do it better today. But at the same time, there's several things we really shouldn't do. Whilst I was thinking about what are the things that we just definitely shouldn't do in class, a lot of them tied with respect, not doing things to disrespect, you know, the class etiquette, let's say. As we go through the list, I want you to think to yourself, have you seen anyone do these things? Do you accidentally do these things? There's a kind of respect that has to happen. When I was coming up with this list, most of them were tied into respect for the dancers around you and the teacher, and also confidence, you know, such as hiding at the back. So as we go through the list, just have a think, are these things you do? Are these things you accidentally do in the class and things you want to avoid? Because if so, this will be a little bit eye-opening for you. So let's dive in. Things to avoid in ballet class. Number one, walking away or talking as the teacher's correcting. I always find this kind of like you're walking away from the queen. No, 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 not okay. You've got to really pay attention, not only for the respect of the teacher, but also what does that say for yourself? You know, if you're talking to the dancer next to you or if you're walking away with your back to the teacher, we've got to be constantly attentive within the ballet class, not just about your own corrections, but other corrections. It's a little bit different when you're, say, in a company. We're, we're adults when we're in a company. If we want to go to the side, then we can. But especially if you're a student, you want to really pay attention to the teacher at all times. You know, within ballet schools, it's definitely just not something we do. We don't really, we don't really talk to each other. That hour and a half where you're in the room, where you're with your teacher, in the studio, that's not a time to chat, that's not a time to socialise, that is full focus time. And so if you find you want to chat to another dancer, that probably tells you that you're not completely fully focused, you're not completely in the room. Really check in with that because the teacher will be kind of thinking about, ah, oh, she's probably not as attentive, she's not as focused. We don't want that, you know, we don't want her to get or him to get the wrong impression of you. So pay attention at all times and make sure when the teacher's speaking to you, you listen. Number two, leaning on the bar between combinations. Now this is a big no-no. Leaning on the bar is a sign of, well, you can kind of tell like, you know, just leaning like this on the bar or looking or even leaning back like that. I mean, actually some of my Vaganova friends, um, obviously we were near the graduation year, but some of my Vaganova friends did actually do that. I'm gonna sit up straight with all this leaning talk. She'll tell me off in a minute. We always found that really strange because at the Royal Ballet School, you know, we were really taught 
um, class etiquette of we don't lean on the bar at all, you know. As a general rule of thumb, leaning on the bar is a sign of I can't be bothered. Maybe misconstrued as being a little bit lazy. Who are you calling lazy? This feels personal. All these kinds of things, all this body language of you're back to the teacher leaning on the bar, it all sends a message, a message which we don't necessarily want to send. Always be super polite, attentive and stand up straight. No need to lean on the bar. We can, we can lie down afterwards. Number three, sitting on the floor after bar. Now, obviously, if you want to sit on the floor, you can sit on the floor. This is more so the case in dropping classes and company class again, um, because in school there's much more rules, you know, and rules which are definitely forced upon you. Um, so if the teacher doesn't allow you to sit on the floor, then you definitely won't be able to. Obviously, we've got to sit on the floor if we want to put our point shoes on, but I would never sit on the floor after bar to rest, you know, which a lot of people actually do. I always take the philosophy that you've come into the studio, you've come into ballet class, ready to work for the next hour and a quarter, hour and a half, however long the class is, it's usually not that long. And by sitting on the floor and allowing your muscles to get cold and allowing them to rest, we're not really building that muscular stamina. We're not keeping them warm and healthy after the work we've just done on the bar. And so it's really critical that you don't allow your muscles to relax and stiffen up after the bar. I always use that time when, when others may sit on the floor. I use the time to stretch, to stretch on the bar, to do some extra exercises. I may do some calf rises. Use that time, because an hour and a half is, is not that long, and we can rest afterwards. No time is wasted, because time is of the essence, especially when we're training. Number four. Try not to zone out when someone else is getting a correction. It's really useful to listen to others' corrections and to apply them to your own dancing. I've learned so much from listening to other people's feedback and mistakes. Sometimes when there's a group before me, for example, in the center, someone gets a correction, I will often learn so much from looking at that dancer, looking at their errors, actually, and thinking, oh yes, she's got that correction because that's like that, that's like that, and it helps you remember to not make that mistake, and it helps you to analyze yourself. Always listen to other people's corrections, and just be careful that you're zoning out when someone else is getting a correction. Number five, using the mirror as your only guide. A lot of schools and a lot of drop-in classes face the mirror, which I love, you know, it's really helpful. In Vaganova, we always face the mirror, mainly because the, the studios are only ever facing one way. Like the floors are all sloped, and so we have to face that way. If we face the other way, it would be really strange, you know. We'd be looking uphill constantly, and it would completely change how we were training and our muscles and everything. And the mirror is an amazing guide. It's an amazing guide for your technique, for understanding your alignment, checking your alignment, checking that you're in the right place. But where we can go wrong and what we wanna avoid is becoming reliant on it and only using that. So a lot of dancers, and I've had this myself, you get so used to facing the mirror that you lose a slight sense of really feeling the sensation of the body. And then when the mirror is removed, instantly you're kind of at a loss because you're not really connecting with the areas or you haven't really trained those senses either of going deeper into the body and really feeling the movement. So whilst at the Royal Ballet School, we, we rarely faced the mirror. Like it was kind of always slightly odd. We, we never faced the mirror ever. And that was quite hard because you didn't really know if it looked any good and it was hard to really correct yourself. Whilst I love facing the mirror <laughs> because we can really see our errors, you don't want it to distract you from your alignment, like you don't want to be looking at it as you're doing a little side eye. <laughs> Use the mirror as a guide of your alignment and your equilibrium in the body, but make sure you're still very present with the sensations of the body, the muscles, feeling the floor, feeling where every body part is, so that when the mirror's removed and you go on stage, or you're in a different studio with no mirror, and you can still dance just as capable if the mirror was there or not. Number six, don't try to dance and avoid trying to dance like the person in front of you. 
because we're all individual, we're all different, and we all need to dance as ourselves. When you're in the ballet class and you've got someone in front of you who's like maybe really going for it with their own personality, whilst you can take inspiration from others, never try to and avoid trying to be exactly like them. It's sort of like, you know, we used to regularly be in rehearsals with people like Olga Smanova, for example. It would be incredibly inspiring. I could easily have watched her and tried to emanate her and completely copy her. I knew that that's not what I wanted to do, but I knew that I really wanted to learn from her and learn how she processed movements and learned how, when she was given an exercise, what she would do with that, you know, where she would put the importance within the exercise. You can take inspiration from others, but you don't need to try to be them because that could jeopardize your own personality from coming out. So that's definitely something I would avoid. Number seven. Another thing to avoid would be copying other people, literally copying them. Now, maybe you struggle with picking up combinations. Okay, let's make this up and see where it goes. Picking up combinations is hard sometimes. Check out my video about how you listen to music and how you pick up combinations and remember things. That's the first thing you need to do is determine how do I actually process combinations? What was that? Do I need to do it with my body? Do I need to do it with my hands? Do I need to repeat it in under my breath in a little whisper? Under Jean, soft slide, step, step and jazz hands. It's a steppity step and jazz hands. So all of these things we need to think about. Then we just gotta practice that and definitely don't copy anybody. Copying is a surefire way to get caught out. You know, especially if suddenly you're at the front. Oh my. Or you get called to the front, you can't see anybody anymore. And then it's like, what do I do now? And this time, let's everybody watch Joey. <laughs> Copying also really detracts from what you need to actually focus on, which is the corrections you were given or the technical skill that needs to happen within this combination. And it's, it's no surprise that I've had some students before who I give them the same correction again and again and again because they haven't actually picked up the combination. And so within the exercise, all they're focusing on is doing the, the combination and copying the person next to them. And so there's no, there's no brain space to then try to apply the correction at the same time. And so naturally your teacher might get a little frustrated um, and wonder what's going on. So if that's an issue for you, then that's something to really, really practice and probably be quite disciplined with yourself. You're probably very used to copying others and it's really not a good idea, especially when you get into an audition scenario, you know, you don't want that to happen. You don't want to have to rely on that because you might be at the front, you might be number one. <laughs> the best thing to do within the class is to really understand your processing style Practice that at home by watching YouTube videos and just kind of listening to the teacher speak and then trying to remember it and, and mark it in your living room. You know, we can practice this as well. Once you understand your processing style, then within the ballet class, really just be disciplined. No copying other people. It's a real skill to pick up choreography. So exercises in the ballet class are very bish bash bosh, very regimented, very usually speaking easy to pick up especially when you get used to a certain teacher's style where it gets difficult is with choreography and neoclassical choreography where there's no structure there's no usual way of doing things and so if you struggle now that's something in later in life that you're going to really struggle with that's going to really hold you back because it's very important to be able to pick up things quickly so really avoid copying others number eight Another thing to avoid would be staying at the back all the time. Come to the front. I always used to be a dancer that would want to be at the front. Not in an arrogant way, not like, look at me, look at, look at what I am. But I just wanted to get the most feedback. Like I wanted to be seen at the front. I wanted to see myself in the mirror to correct myself. I just wanted to have the best experience I possibly could. And I thought, well, I'm here, so I'm gonna try my best. So that means being at the front, getting seen, getting the feedback, seeing myself and correcting myself. When you stand at the back all the time, you're kind of also sending a message to yourself that that's the only place that you deserve to be. I deserve just to be at the back. I'm not good enough. I can't pick up things. Uh, the teacher doesn't wanna see me. There's better people who should be at the front. You know, all these things you're sending yourself. And whilst, 
you may be comfortable at the back and it's your comfort zone and you know you can do the combination well at the back, it's really important to challenge yourself and to get out of your comfort zone and to be in a place where you're going to grow as a person and also as a dancer, which means that you need to force yourself occasionally to go to the front. And if you're not used to being at the front, go to the front in a combination where you're definitely very confident, whether that's in the adage combination. A lot of you will be screaming. Absolutely not. <laughs> or if it's another combination such as the first changement in échappé, we can handle this. And with when we do corner combinations, don't always wait for like the fifth group. Try to go in the first group sometime. I would always go in the first group. In the schools and things, when you're in a school as a student, you're kind of told when to go. In classes where we have the control, I would always choose to go in the first group, mainly because I just loved having that introductory music. I loved feeling the introduction before I went into the into the combination, which I really enjoyed. Think about which group you go in usually within the center exercises. Are you always the second group, you know? So you're always relying again on learning the exercise when the first group's going. When actually you should probably be, if you are the second group, you should have learned the exercise straight away. And then you're going through all the things you need to remember and focus on when it's your turn to go rather than giving yourself that extra time to pick up the combination. We should have picked it up by now. Number nine. All right, this is something I really want students to listen to because a lot of people do this and I always think, no, you must finish. not finishing the combination, especially corner combinations, not finishing it properly and just walking off straight away. So sometimes what happens is, let's say a, a pirouette doesn't go super well, um, in the in the pirouette combination from the corner and they might slightly fall out of it and then just walk off or they might do pirouette, chene, pose, walk off you're not training that real hold and finish therefore when you're doing a variation or when you're doing something difficult your body won't be able to go back to that muscle memory of how we finish combinations well how we finish on balance how we finish with a pause. And so it's really important, no matter how the pirouette went, we finish things. We finish things and then we try again. So whatever it is, I want you to finish and pose and then walk off. Because actually a lot of, it's to, a lot of it is training the supporting leg to stabilize before you step into that pose. And if you're constantly falling into the last pose and going off, then you're never really feeling how to finish properly. And so it's really important, the starts and finishes of things. And so if you're constantly not finishing the combination, it's you're going to look messy, basically, and you're going to have messy finishes to your diagonals, to your variations. So make sure, no matter how the combination's gone, you finish that. You finish that exercise. And then it will just really upgrade everything. Another thing to avoid in ballet class, it's quite a long list. Let's say there's a group in front who's doing a jumping combination and we need to go the next group but they haven't really traveled and so you're quite far back and the thing to avoid and this goes both ways for the group that's in the center what you've got to really avoid is running directly face face into the next person into the next group and that's really frustrating for the next dancer who's starting so if you're the person who's finished in the group, don't run towards, whether it's a corner combination, whether it's a center combination, never run towards the dancers who are about to go because you'll be in the way, to put it, <laughs> to put it bluntly. So when you finished, you run off stage, off the studio in the opposite direction. You know, whether if it's a corner combination, you run quickly to the side or quickly downstage out the corner, wherever the quickest exit is that's not towards the dancers. Now, if you are a dancer who's coming in, let's say we're in doing a center combination and we need to run forwards because there's no space, and those dancers are kind of running towards you, usually speaking, the best bet, towards the end of the exercise, you notice where the gaps are and you run into those gaps. A lot of people, just because they're lacking confidence, a lot of people hesitate to come forwards and hesitate 
to come forwards into the gaps to start the next combination. Sometimes what I would do is actually go around, let's say the dancers are dancing here, I would go around the side and they're dancing here. And instead of running down this way, trying to find a gap as they're dancing, I'd actually run down the side and run, as they're about to finish, run forwards and find a gap. So that was way out of the way. And then they would either run sideways or run backwards. And so don't be afraid to find the space when the previous group is finishing. Find the space and run into that space. Don't waste time because you want to do that combination really well. You don't want anything to get in the way of the beginning, such as, oh, no space, someone's bashing into me. Find the space, confidently go into it so you can do the combination well. All right, spatial awareness. This one's tricky. Um, now, when we're in the center doing our center combinations, it's a little bit easier. We're on the spot most of the time. And so it's easier to be spatially aware. When it becomes tricky is traveling combinations and traveling diagonals, traveling jumps, as well as running into a space in a center combination. So let's talk about these few things. When it's a center combination and it's going back to back, like what I just mentioned with finding a space, it's really important you're aware of others as well. So when you run into the center and you found your space, let's say someone's come and run and stood really close to you, then you need to make a quick adjustment, just like, right, and just take a step back or take a step forwards. One thing I always like to think about is staggering yourself. So if there's dancers either side of you and they're both directly in line with you, chances are that if you're doing something that requires a kick of the leg or a slight, slightly medium to large jump, chances are they're gonna be a bit close to you, especially if you were doing Alice Con turns and it was a Grand Batman exercise. And so if those dancers haven't really thought about it and stood either side of you, then you take charge here and stagger yourself. You go slightly forwards or go slightly backwards because you don't wanna hit anyone. It will also inhibit how you actually go into the movement itself. You won't go into it super confidently um, because you'll be worried about hitting someone which we don't want. So that's that scenario. Now another scenario is a diagonal, be it a pirouette combination um, or a jumping combination. So let's start with pirouettes. Pirouettes, again, I would always go and try to, If you, this is if you have choice, I'd always try to be the front one um, and then I'd always try to be slightly slightly downstage, you know, so I'm really out of the way of the others. Not, not obviously out of the way that I lose my diagonal, but I've made sure that I'm slightly forward. So if you're in the front row of a diagonal, make sure you're not standing so far back that there's, there's two other people behind you who definitely have no space. And then if you don't travel, they'll be completely squished. Just remember, you're not on your own. <laughs> so when you're doing the combination, just always have this image of there's a laser beam between you all and that length of line has to stay the same. And so when you're going around in different directions, don't allow that gap to like close too much. Now, if we were traveling around in a, in a circle, for example, you want to just imagine that that shape doesn't really change. So one person should not change location. That's when it gets really higgledy-piggledy and when things get difficult. So as you're moving around, you want to really take that box and take that with you. Whatever the formation is, just be aware of those around you and try to have that imagery and feeling of you're keeping the space the same throughout. So when you do run forwards into the next group, just be super hyper aware for the last two seconds. Am I really close to somebody? I'll run forwards. Okay, cool. Off we go. Avoid cramming people's style. Ah, uh, just finished plie. Mm. Mm. Drinking water between combinations of the bar. Now, this kind of baffles me. Now, to put it to extremes, in Vaganova, we're not allowed to drink. Like, at all. I'm not allowed to drink at all in the entire ballet class. And that was something I definitely struggled with. 
but I'm dying here, like I really need to drink. Sometimes I would sneak a bit of water after bar. I understand what they're coming from. They, they think that it's unhealthy for you to drink water during the ballet class when your muscles are really working hard and your heart is working hard. They think that filling your stomach with water, the blood goes to your stomach, takes oxygen away from the muscles. I think it's bad. I'm like, I understand what you're saying. I understand what you're saying, but my muscles are cramping. There's a fine line, I think. Having sips though, sort of at the bar, I think is kind of training yourself to not be able to get through much exercise without hydrating. Ballet exercises and ballets can be quite long. You might be on stage for 10 minutes uh, without coming off stage. You might not have time to have a sip of water. And so most often we would always train ourselves to be hydrated. And I would obviously, if I'm not allowed to drink in the whole class, would be super hydrated. Um, the night before and in the morning I would hydrate myself a lot. That's why I always have electrolytes because water just isn't quite enough when you're sweating that much. Um, you start to feel dizzy and depleted. So I would always have electrolyte drinks, you know, isotonic drinks that had a lot of natural salts in them, glycogen, glucose, you know, um, which would really get me through. Sort of like the tennis players in Wimbledon, you know, they've ha they'd have the lemonade in one hand or the cloudy drink and the Evian water in the other. Uh oh, see that attach us. Completely obsessive about his water bottles. I would always admire watching them and think, oh my gosh, oh, he's having his uh, his lemonade isotonic drink and now he's having his water. Um, but it's really key, athletes really need this. Now what you don't necessarily need to do is have a sip of water during ballet class. Just remember every action you take has consequences. Everything you're doing is a choice and everything you're doing really will build habits within you and will determine the result and the outcome. If you decide to have a sip of water during the bar, which is not that long, it's half an hour, 45 minutes. If you decide to have a drink, you're allowing your body to oh, take that take that sip, you know, and to not build that muscular stamina, not build its resources. So whilst I'm not saying you need to dance dehydrated, I don't want you to dance dehydrated, we need to make sure we are optimally hydrated before we even begin, you know, hydrated enough so that you can withstand 45 minutes. I go in completely hydrated, sometimes, sometimes, just before jumps, have a little sip, but it's a really small sip, not drinking too much when you do drink. So let's say we're not drinking during bar, we've established we're okay, we're hydrated enough to get through it. Especially if you're a student in a school, you're not gonna be able to have a bottle near you because it's all about the aesthetic and standing on the bar with a bottle underneath doesn't look nice, you know, um, especially in school studios. And so often it just wouldn't be a thing. But when you're professional, when you're dancing every day, your body's used to it and you shouldn't need a drink. If your teacher does allow you to have a drink after bar um, or before jumps, then make sure you're not drinking too much. Sometimes I've seen students, you know, really guzzle and, and really take in so much water, but that water's gonna be moving around and may make you feel sick during the ballet class. And so you just wanna have a little bit of a sip. That's another reason why I really love isotonic drinks because you only need a sip to feel good. You kind of need a lot more water than the isotonic drink to feel good again. And so just take a little sip of your isotonic drink. I'm talking like three sips max. You really don't need much. And then you're full energized and fine. The key thing with all this is to make sure you're efficiently hydrated before we even start. So whilst I'm doing my warm up routine, um, I would have had a huge glass of water in the morning. I always have a huge glass of water when I wake up. And then whilst you're doing your warm up routine, have some sips of water you know, have some sips of your isotonic drink so that you're hydrating, you know, even as you're warming up and then you're ready to go for the ballet class. But try not to get used to drinking too much throughout the ballet class. You're kind of, again, telling your body that you're going to need this. Then when it comes to the point where you're 
on stage or in, or you're in a variation you're or you're in an unfamiliar scenario where you don't have access to your water all the time um, it will really affect your performance and you'll really struggle. Another thing to avoid, and this is the final thing for now, I can definitely come up with more, but we'll leave it here today, is not saying thank you to the teacher um, at the end of the ballet class. In ballet schools in particular, it was really strict with what we had to do. Like, not just in Russia, but the Royal Ballet School and even a performing arts school I went to before that. Always when a teacher would walk past, we'd be like, good afternoon, or... In um, Vaganova, we'd be like, Strasbourg and have to like slightly curtsy to them, you know, Strasbourg as we'd see them. And if we didn't say hello, it'd be really weird. I always um, got really confused in um, the Russian language because sometimes the teacher would be like super friendly, like Altenai, Altenai Silmaratova. We'd often cross paths in the corridor, and I was always like, <gasps> okay. So I would always say, ah, oh, Strasbourg, you know. And sometimes she would say, ah, oh, Privet, Isabella. And Privet is very colloquial, it's very friendly. It's like, hi, or hey, you know. Whereas Strasvitya is very formal. It's a formal hello, it's a respectful hello. Um, and so sometimes when she would say, um, or the teacher would be like, Privet, I would be like, do I say Privet back? Or is that too casual, you know? Um, sometimes, sometimes if they started with pre Privet, I would say, ah, oh, Privet as well. I was like, oh my God, have I, have I disrespected them now? That's the tricky thing with languages. We'd always say thank you after the class as well, like, spasiba, bolshoi, blah, 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 you know, or thank you very much. And it's just a sign of respect. In dropping classes, I just go up to them afterwards and people do it to me. Often it's the students who are in ballet schools, you know, who really, um, make a point of coming up to me and saying thanks. But, um... A lot of people are used to saying thank you and things like that, but um, and I don't mind, especially if I see people all the time and they have to go, etc. Dropping classes, you know, I would, I myself, if I was dancing, would really make a point of going up to the teacher and saying, "Thank you so much for class," you know, because they've they've made an effort in the ballet class, they've taken the time to teach you, to give you feedback, um, and. It's a really tough job teaching class. It's a really tough job being a ballet teacher, being a ballet coach. A lot of work and effort and energy goes into it to give to other people. It's completely different to dancing. I would say no matter what scenario you're in, be it company, uh, you're a student in a ballet school, or you're just taking drop-in classes, take a moment to say thank you to the teacher. Funnily enough, when you say thank you to the teacher, you kind of finally meet the person. Because often when you come in to the studio and you start teaching, we're not having a conversation obviously because we're doing the class. And so the teacher might take note of you and might take note of the things that you need to work on because they've been correcting you and they've noticed you and they've been helping you throughout the ballet class, but they haven't actually met you yet. And they may not even know your name yet. And so when you go up to them at the end and you say, oh, thank you very much, not only is it nice and respectful, it might trigger them to give you more feedback and to say something more to you and to be like, oh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, what's your name? I do this, you know, I'm when people come to me for the first time, um, I would say, oh, thank you so much. What's your name? Where are you from? What, what are you studying? Where are you training? You know, and it might trigger a conversation. So guys, thank you so much. Quite a big list of things. Like I said, I could definitely make it a much longer list. There's always so many things um, we need to work on, but most of them are class etiquette, spatial awareness, um, making sure you're doing things for yourself that are gonna benefit you, such as going to the front, not copying others. And then there's the respect side of things, respecting the teacher and behavioral, things to do to show signs of respect not just to the teacher but to the dancers around you so i hope this is really helpful i hope you enjoyed this maybe you learned something today that you didn't know was actually a sign of respect or something you should do within the ballet class so please click that subscribe button so you never miss another video i really enjoy making these videos for you and helping you on your journey to being a successful ballet dancer, professional ballet dancer, or whatever it is you're doing in your life. 
So thanks for taking the time to watch the video and I'll see you very soon. Bye for now.